Hi, my name is Mike Sklash. I am senior hydrogeologist at the Dragon Corporation. Dragon is an environmental consulting firm with offices in the United States and Canada. I am hosting this series of webinars that provides you with 10 tools that will help to solve your groundwater contamination problem. My colleague, Jason Stilger, is going to talk about subsurface investigation basics today. This is how we get started on our solution to uh, remediation. So uh, here's the list of uh, 10 uh, topics we're gonna be talking about. Uh, number five is today, and Jason is gonna take it away. Hello, I'm Jason Stilger. I'm a senior geologist with the Dragon Corporation. I have my bachelor's of science in geology. I got that from Wayne State University. I've been a consultant and with Dragon for 11 years. I specialize in site assessments, including soil, groundwater, and vapor, and UST removals. Uh, so for this webinar, we're going to be doing the subsurface investigation basics. Uh, the whole intent of this is to get our arms around the problem. Uh, to do that, we have to determine the geology, determine groundwater conditions, including the depth, flow direction, and velocity, and determine the distribution of chemicals and transport rates. This webinar is going to be broken into four different sections, um, including drilling techniques, soil sampling and logging, monitoring well installation, groundwater monitoring and sampling, and hydraulic conductivity measurements. Uh, so part one is introduction to drilling, soil sampling, and logging. Uh, in this section, we are going to be discussing several types of drilling rigs. Um, and the one that's best for you is dependent on several different factors, including geology, depth, access, sample integrity, monitoring wells, uh, if water is used during the drilling process, the speed of the drilling, the waste disposal from your cuttings, the availability of drill rigs, and the overall budget. The first rig is a hollow stem auger. Uh, seen in the photo here. This is a fairly large machine and has a pretty good capability to get down to depth. As the name indicates, it's a hollow stem auger, so they use these steel augers that are hollow inside with a cutting head to get down to depth and collect samples through the hollow part of the rig. It's the same rig, but it uses different tooling. It's a solid stem auger. So for these types of rig, we usually collect samples with a split spoon sampler. It's a stainless steel sampler that's approximately two feet in length. It is hammered into the ground with the drill rig, pulled up to the surface and split open to have a complete core sample for you to classify and collect your samples from. Um, so the sampler is lowered into the hole and the hammer on the rig um, hammers it down until it gets its two feet in length, and then the sample is pulled up to surface for the geologist. Um, so as the name kind of indicates, it splits in half. You end up with this nice core of soil. Uh, it's approximately an inch and a half in diameter, and the geologist gets a chance to classify this and describe any changes in soil conditions to help us understand the geology of the site. Uh, a different variant of the hollow stem rigs is an angled hollow stem drill rig. Uh, it still uses the same tooling and the same rig, but it just is put onto an angle. And this allows for drilling to get under areas that have lower clearance or utilities that may hinder the drilling process. So with this rig, we can go on an angle and get directly underneath our gas pump or the dispenser lines for the tanks. So some of the pros and cons for the hollow stem auger, the pros are that they're commonly available, they're economical, they're versatile, mobile, and they're fast. Generally, there's no water introduced during the drilling and you come up with undisturbed samples. Uh, the cons are that they're not really effective on boulders or rocks. You can get to about 100 feet in depth as a maximum. Uh, and if you're sampling, it becomes less efficient at depth. 
uh, you end up having a large borehole versus your monitoring well. And there's a significant waste of soil with the cuttings that would come into your budget as well. A uh, second type of drilling technique is the direct push or in the industry known as geoprobe. Uh, this is probably one of the most common types of drilling in the environmental world. It uses a hydraulic hammer and the weight of the machine to push a stainless steel sampler into the ground for your samples. Uh, in these pictures above, it shows the geoprobe in several different scenarios, including on a hill where other rigs may not be able to get to, uh, parking lots, a couple of them in front of a, a residential area. Uh, you can see the compact size of the rigs. Uh, they take up a lot less space than the hollow stem augers. Um, and then you also have the ability to add on different type of tooling, such as the MIP or the HPT, uh, to get additional data from your drilling activities. So the sampling is done, and a four to five foot sampler comes up from the rig, and we get these cores of soil in acetate liners. Uh, you can see that they're about an inch and a half in diameter, and we use these to classify uh, and describe the soil. Some of the pros for the direct push method is that they're small in size, they're mobile, they're fast, they're inexpensive, they're commonly available, no water is introduced during the drilling, you come up with uh, nice core samples for the entire length of your boring, there's limited waste, uh, generally just the coring, the actual samples that you pull out from the ground, and you can add on tools for high resolution characterization. Uh, some of the cons are that they cannot be used on sites that have boulders or rocks. There's a depth limitation. Some of the smaller rigs, uh, depending on the geology, can only get to about 15 feet, where you can order some of the larger rigs where you may be able to get deeper than that. Um, but they're still limited compared to the hollow sim auger. Lastly, the monitoring well and groundwater sampling could have limitations. A lot of times with this rig, you end up installing a smaller diameter well. So depending on the type of sample and the depth to water, you may have to plan for different types of equipment to collect your sample. Next, we have the Sonic rig. I'm just going to go through a couple different rigs here and then do the pros and cons. The mud rotary and the air rotary. These types of rigs are not commonly used for environmental sampling. Each of them are great at being able to get to depth and getting through rocks and boulders, but there's major limitations that really affect the quality of your sample. For the sonic rig, the vibration of the rig produces a lot of heat, which heats up your sample, which could burn off the OCs. So you may have an under-representation uh, with your laboratory data. The mud rotary rig introduces water and mud to the drilling process, which affects your sample, and it's blown out, not in intact cores. Uh, so you don't have a direct reference of where the soil came from when it comes up to the surface. And that's the same with the air rotary, where air is pushing the sample up to the surface after it drills, and the introduction of air is going to affect your sample as well. So these three methods aren't typically used very often in the environmental world other than to install wells, but not really good for the soil sampling aspect. Uh, lastly, we have the rock coring. This is when you're into rock and bedrock. This goes down and can drill through using a diamond head and pull out intact cores of bedrock. So you can classify that as well. So next we're going to move on to the environmental logging. Uh, first, we're going to discuss the soil boring. So with the classification and the description of the soil for your subsurface investigation, there's uh, several things that the geologists look at to describe the soil. Uh, these include your sampling interval, the soil recovery, your PID readings, your primary and secondary components, color, density, moisture, and staining. And lastly, if there's any odor present in the soil. Um, same for the rock coring, where it's similar to the soil. There's a few different categories that we look at. We're really trying to get as much information to describe and classify what we're seeing from the samples that are brought up to the surface. Uh, in this picture here, 
We have two examples of rock cores. Neither of the cores are weathered to the point where it would allow significant groundwater flow. The core on the left is limestone. There's no visible fractures, but the porosity on the right side of the core, if connected, porosity may help transmit groundwater and chemicals through the subsurface. Core on the right here is nice. Uh, the porosity and primary hydraulic conductivity would be expected to be extremely low with this type of rock. Uh, it appears that there was a fracture beneath this paper clip here, but it appears to have been filled in, so it's unlikely to contribute to hydraulic conductivity. Uh, here's uh, an example of one of our geologists looking at the soil. Uh, we use visual uh, cues and clues, um, touch, olfactory senses to help us describe each component of the soil. Uh, one of our main tools while we're describing the soil is a photo ionization detector, or PID. This helps us measure volatile organic compounds in the soil. Typically, when we're doing our sampling, we do every six inches or so, uh, and just do a quick check to see if there's any VOCs present there. Uh, this is a great tool to kind of highlight some hot spots or highest impacted areas of the soil, but it doesn't really tell us what kind of chemicals are there, just the uh, concentration. Uh, next, our geologists, we look at the soil texture. Uh, this is good because in fine-grained soils, uh, using your eye, you're not going to be able to differentiate between silt and uh, clay, but by touch, you can feel the difference between the two. And also, just by rolling it, uh, it has different characteristics from silt to clay. Additionally, we look for soil structures. This picture here, we have an example of varved clay, uh, but some other structures that we look for can include platy soils, bedding, fractures, or roots that are impacting the structure of the soil as well. Um, these structures can assist in determining the transport roots in the soil and can be a mechanism for chemicals to get deeper into the subsurface. Uh, lastly, we look at sheen or free products and we use our olfactory senses for the overall strength of the chemical impact. Uh, in this example, we have a pretty heavy sheen on the surface uh, from the soil sample. Um, and with that, sometimes when we're looking for free product, we'll use a Sudan 4 test, which has an activator and you have a certain amount of soil and water, you mix it together. If it turns red, it indicates that there's a high value of total petroleum hydrocarbons in the soil, which is indicative of free product. Uh, next, we're going to move on to the Dragon's iPad system. Uh, we saw some examples earlier on of some handwritten environmental logs, but at Dragon, several years ago, we moved on to an iPad system. This has all the same information that we we're getting from the paper but it also helped us be a little more uniform in our classification between different geologists. Uh, so this has different drop-down menus with keywords and descriptors that we like as a company to describe the soil. And by doing this, we always have the right information filled out. And regardless of who goes out into the field, we have a similar soil boring when we come back. With the iPads, we collect all the data out in the field, and then when we come back to the office, that data can be uploaded, and some magic can be thrown in through a program, and we get some soil boring logs that can be generated very quickly and very accurately compared to our paper copies that had to be typed up, reviewed, and then put into a different format completely. Section two is gonna be on monitoring well installation. Uh, the objectives, with this is to determine groundwater elevation, obtain representative groundwater samples, evaluate field hydraulic conductivity. This is a very basic diagram of the important parts of a monitoring well. Uh, we're just gonna go through this quickly, but we have our well here in the center, which is comprised of a PVC or a stainless steel uh, riser pipe. And then once into the water, we have a screen that allows water to get into our well for our sampling. We have that followed by a sand pack, which helps remove fine grains from the water. That's capped off with a bentonite seal, 
to help prevent any water from getting into our well screen. Uh, this is completed with an annular seal, which is typically a bentonite or a slurry. And then we follow that up with another bentonite seal near the surface to again, prevent any on grade impacts from entering our water table. Bentonite is a clay, which expands when it gets wet. And it's a really good tool for us uh, for well installation to prevent the migration of chemicals from contaminated areas to deeper locations where we may be sampling. In some cases, we install a double casing where this is more of a extreme measure, really ensure that no chemicals or water from a different aquifer or a different source area is gonna enter our sampling location and our screens. You drill one section down into the ground to a certain depth and then you fill this in and you're able to drill directly through the center of that casing to a different depth and then seal it all up. And this really ensures that you're not gonna have any influence from different aquifers in your subsurface. Section three is on groundwater monitoring and sampling. Uh, so once the well is installed, we use those wells to collect information on the groundwater elevation and collect groundwater samples. For the groundwater elevation, we typically use a water level meter. This tool here is lowered into the well and it allows us to get a measurement of the water from the surface to the water table. We measure from a surveyed top of casing um, and we take our water level measurement and that top of casing to get a groundwater elevation. Uh, it's important to collect all your measurements within the same day or if there's any major changes in the weather conditions, you wanna to try to get that all before any major pressure changes occur. Uh, lastly, you want to inspect your tape and your probe. And with this, if you're doing groundwater elevations with multiple people, it's always a good idea to have everyone take a measurement from the same location with their different uh, water levels to make sure everyone's getting the same type of reading. Another tool that's used for groundwater elevation is an interface probe. This tool is used when there may be free product or separate phase product in a well. This tool can tell the difference between the separate phase and water. So this way we can get a free product measurement as well as the depth to water. Groundwater sampling and purging. For this, while we purge the well, we check the chemistry to ensure that we're getting proper water in so that we have a representative sample. We typically use a low flow sampling method. The purpose of this is to minimize the volatile loss. Um, it uses a low pumping rate and it limits the drawdown in the well. And the whole purpose for the purging is to remove standing water until groundwater chemistry is stabilized. Our field parameters, which include pH, temperature, conductivity, EH and turbidity. We stabilize those parameters before we collect our groundwater sample. Uh, for the groundwater sampling, there's two different methods that can be used for the sampling. One is a, a high flow or a volume sampling method, which uses tools such as the Baylor or Watera check valves. Uh, and the second type is low flow sampling, which is where the samples are collected using a peristaltic pump or a bladder pump. Uh, sampling with a Baylor, uh, it has a couple pros where it's inexpensive and they're easy to use. You can remove large quantities of water in a short duration of time. But with that, you end up with some negative effects. While sampling with a baler, you can disturb the sediment at the bottom of the well. Uh, if you're testing for metals, this can give some false positive concentrations uh, with the metals being in the sediment and not really in the water. Just by the method of dropping the baler into the well, and agitating the water, you're going to have some degassing of any volatiles that are in the water. Um, and by doing this, you may have an underestimate of VOC concentrations. Um, the other high volume method is the Watera or a check valve. Just like the balers, they're inexpensive and they're easy to use and they can remove large quantities of water very quickly. Cons associated with this method is that they have a lot of the same problems as the balers. So you're agitating the water, you're possibly having higher turbidity, which can give you false metal counts and an underrepresentation of VOCs in your sample. So in the end, you end up with poor sample quality and a sample that may not be representative of your subsurface conditions.
Um, for the low volume sampling, we have peristaltic pump. These are very simple to use. There's just a, a knob and a couple switches. You can control the flow rate uh, down to uh, about 50 milliliters per minute. Uh, they're durable and running on a battery, you can sample multiple days. Uh, the cons are that they're really only effective in shallow groundwater applications, between seven meters or 23 feet. Anything deeper than that, the pump is really gonna be struggling to get the water to the surface. Uh, the other low flow sampling method is the bladder pump. These are used for typically for deeper groundwater applications. Um, they have controls on it, so you can really control the flow rate. And just like the peristaltic, they're durable. Some of the cons are that they may not function within a well with only 30 to 40 centimeters of water. So you need to have a good water source with enough pressure to get that up to the surface. Uh, they're a little more complex to use than the peristaltic and a little more finicky uh, with their controllers to get the water up to the surface. So now we're going to be collecting our sample once you pick your method. And when we're doing our low flow sampling, we're monitoring the drawdown of the water table. We're collecting field parameters uh, using a couple different types of tools to get our chemistry. And then once our chemistry is stabilized, we collect our samples in our bottles, store those in our coolers. And you always have to make sure that you have clean gloves between different stages of your sampling and always before you collect your sample. I'm gonna pass this section to Mike and he's gonna talk about hydraulic conductivity measurements. One of the things we have to do is to determine how quickly the groundwater and chemicals are moving. And we base this on Darcy's law, which in one form talks about the amount of water. This is the form we're looking at most of the time. Velocity equals hydraulic conductivity times hydraulic gradient divided by the porosity. So what we're gonna focus on is measuring hydraulic conductivity. Uh, Jason talked about water level measurements. Before we can use that information for the hydraulic gradient I and porosity, generally we use tables of porosity uh, that we have in the literature. So we wanna know the hydraulic conductivity so we can figure out how much groundwater is moving, how quickly it's moving, and as a result, how quickly are the contaminants moving. So there are many methods to estimate hydraulic conductivity. Some directly evaluate the parameters to determine hydraulic conductivity. That would be something like putting a tracer into the groundwater and watching how fast it moves. Some are empirical, like looking at grain size distributions, the amount of gravel sand, silt and clay, and you get an idea of the hydraulic conductivity based on that. But one of the things that's really different for all these are scale issues. Sometimes we're looking at small samples. Sometimes we're doing field tests. So scale issues are important, and we don't have really necessarily good apples to apples comparisons of the methods. So this is Part of the reason why, you know, when we look at natural cores and, and outcrops of rock, we can see that there's big differences. This is one core going down vertically. You can see changes from sandy to clay to gravelly here. And all that's going to have different hydraulic conductivity. Uh, so you need to know, you know, whether you're focusing on one small area or you're focusing on the large area. Uh, Jason showed this slide before. It's a bar of clay, and you can see that there's variations. If we measured hydraulic conductivity horizontally versus vertically, it'd be quite different. And then we have the question of fractures, which affect groundwater flow. One of the easiest methods, if you've got granular soils like sands, is to use uh, grain size distributions, and you use sieves and hydrometers to get a grain size distribution. You do some plotting on a graph. You get what's called the effect of grain size, which is the size in which 10% is finer. And the hydraulic conductivity is equal to about the D10, effective grain size squared. That's a simple method for estimating hydraulic conductivity. Other lab methods that we can use are constant head permeometer, 
like we see in this advertisement. And this is good for measuring high hydraulic conductivity materials like sand. For lower hydraulic conductivity materials like silt, you can use a falling head permeometer. And basically, you put your material in this chamber, it's all saturated, and you watch the water level fall as water flows through your chamber. If we go in the field, we, we could be using other tests like single well tests or aquifer tests. In a single well test, you're basically changing the water level in a single well and watching how quickly it goes back to equilibrium. And the rate at which it goes back to equilibrium is a function of the hydraulic conductivity. In an aquifer test, we're looking at a number of wells, looking over a larger area. We pump water from one well and we observe the water level changes in wells that may be 10 meters, 30 feet, 100 feet, 30 meters, and so on, away from the pumping well. And you're able to analyze that data and get properties of the aquifer from that. There's lots of different pros and cons of doing the various techniques. Uh, for example, uh, one of the advantages of the aquifer test is that we can find something about the aerial and spatial limitations of the aquifer, the boundaries. And one of the problems with it is you can have a large amount of contaminated wastewater that you need to store and then dispose. Single well tests are simple and quick, uh, but they only tell you the hydraulic conductivity in a small area and they can be affected by the well completion. Uh, lab tests are easy to control and uh, there's good repeatability, but it's not in situ. The samples are disturbed and you don't see structure. And parameter estimation, like looking at the grain size, is easy and inexpensive, but your sample is disturbed. There's no structure involved and so on. We've looked at understanding some of the basic uh, subsurface investigation techniques to understand the groundwater conditions and the groundwater contamination so we can go on to find a solution to the problem. We've looked briefly at drilling, soil sampling and logging, well installation, measuring water levels, sampling groundwater, and evaluating hydraulic conductivity. We're well on our way to developing a conceptual site model that we can use to address and fix the groundwater contamination problem. In the next webinar, we'll be doing number six, the high resolution investigation tools. These are techniques that give us uh, more precise information and allow us to strategically remediate a site and, and use tools where they're needed and we can focus our cost in that way. So we want to thank you for listening to us today. And on behalf of Jason, hope you'll join us for some of our other uh, webinars.